We are going to read uh, Numbers uh, chapter 12 this morning. It's a, a mere 16 verses. I want to set it up for you because it, it correlates with uh, the block of Scripture we're going to be uh, looking into this morning. So you've got Miriam and Aaron, uh, the sister and brother of Moses, both uh, called on by the Lord to serve Him in different and distinct ways than Moses, in different and distinct ways from one another. And yet, uh, they fall into uh, a temptation that uh, many uh, Christians are susceptible to. And it's really the temptation of ingratitude, ingratitude for uh, the way that they've been gifted to serve God. So, Numbers chapter 12, starting in verse 1, I've got the ESV translation of the scriptures. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. And suddenly the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. And the three of them came out, and the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forward. And he said, Hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth, clearly and not in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. When the cloud removed from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous like snow. And Aaron turned toward Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said to Moses, O oh, my Lord, do not punish us because we have done foolishly and have sinned. Let her not be as one dead whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried to the Lord, O oh God, please heal her, please. But the Lord said to Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, should she not be shamed seven days? Let her be shut outside the camp seven days, and after that she may be brought in again. So Miriam was shut outside the camp seven days, and the people did not set out on the march till Miriam was brought in again. After that, the people set out from Hazaroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your mercy, your steadfastness. God, we thank you that you are a God of order. You are a God who saves and sanctifies according to your good will, your good pleasure, your good order. God, we thank you that both male and female, we are created in the image of of you, our great God. We are both given great privileges, great responsibilities. Each of us has a, a great calling because you are a great and mighty Savior, a great God. You are worthy of great praise. God, help us never to forget none of us are able to worship you because of who we are, but because of who you are. Let us all the days of our lives walk in humility and gratitude and obedient servant, servants marked by love. God, we love you. We praise you. And we thank you. We pray all this 
in the great and matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we are going to pick up where we left off a few weeks ago, 1 Timothy chapter 2. We are going to be uh, looking into verses 8 to 15. Uh, however, we're, we've got to take these verses in context. I will not be preaching through all seven verses uh, today. We primarily focus on the first three of these verses, 8, 9, and 10. I can't tell you if this is going to be a part two, part one of a part two, or part one of a part three. Um, but that's okay. We're not in a hurry. And, um, you know, one... Uh, important aspect of this block of scripture is it is these are some of the most misconstrued misunderstood misapplied verses in the entire bible and one of the reasons that is is because uh, we as believers do not take the appropriate amount of time to really dig in and to feast on the truth uh, that god has given us so um we are going to take our time and do that. Uh, I will read and then, uh, and then pray and we will dig in. 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 8. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise, also, that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls, or costly attire, but with what is proper for a woman who professes godliness, with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived. But the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Let's pray. Uh, Father God, we thank you for your word, which is infallible. The Holy Spirit, just help to illuminate our minds and our hearts to the truth of these words. Feed us with the food that is necessary for us so that we may grow in holiness and righteousness and that you, Father God, may be glorified in all that we do. Who are we? Who are we? We are thankful for the salvation that we have in and through Jesus Christ. And it's in his great, mighty, supreme, perfect name that we pray. Amen. All right, so there's a couple of things that we've got we've to remember. We've got to remember that this epistle is written to Timothy for the purpose of putting the church at Ephesus back into order. They are worship disordered. Their worship of God is disordered. And Paul has sent Timothy and is giving Timothy these instructions so that the church at Ephesus will be put back into order. And so what is the church? That's really an important question. If we don't understand the answer to that question, uh, we are going to go terribly wrong as we look into the rest of these verses. So what is the church? Now, one definition would be a divinely chosen, empowered, and sustained institution of spiritually rebirthed people. So, the church is from God, for God, and the church is us. It's people, spiritually rebirthed people. It's not... A man-made institution. Men did not come up with the idea of let's gather for worship. It is a divinely chosen and empowered institution. Uh, just stay right here in 1 Timothy. Just look at chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. 
And Paul says, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth, the household of God, the family of God, how we ought to behave. How are we to worship God? We are the church, the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Everything that we do is representative of God and the truth. And the people of God are established by God. And not every church is part of the church. There are many gatherings of people who claim to be churches. And they are not. There are, not every Christian is a little Christ. That's what Christian means. A little Christ. A, a follower. A disciple of Christ. So how do we know the true church from the imposters? We know them by their fruits. Fruit of the Spirit, which only comes from those who are living by and according to the Word of God. You know, we should be amazed at how the church has been established. It's the... The inclusive call, by the inclusive call for all to come to God. Just look back to verse 4 here in chapter 2. It's God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. This inclusive calling that all would repent and believe and be saved. Yet, the exclusive way in which one enters into a relationship with God. That's verse 5. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. He is, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, the narrow gate, the only way. He is the resurrection and the life. The existence of, the power of, the purpose of, and the charge of the church is mediated through Jesus Christ. Remember, what's a mediator? That a person who brings two parties that are warring or at enmity with each other together. Well, why? Why mediation? Well, how else are unholy creatures going to coexist with a holy God, a holiness that is so holy that if we're exposed to even a fraction of it, we're killed. What is the charge of the church? We go back to chapter 1, verse 5. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. If you were here back when I preached these verses, I, I would like to posit, suggest that this is the key verse in the entire epistle. A love that issues from a pure heart being born again. We can only share the love of Christ if we've been born again. A good conscience, conscience not living in violation of God's word. but seeking to uphold and adhere and exalt it because it exalts him. And a sincere faith. Faith always has an object. The, our object, the object of our faith is the person of Jesus Christ. He is who we are exalting and glorifying and obeying. So this is so important as we consider the church and in what setting is this charge of the church going to be on full display? Well, when the saints gather to worship. And this is the context that this instruction is given. 
It's in the context of corporate worship, right? What has Paul laid out? He's laid out the gospel. He's laid out that all men should be prayed for, that no one who is living today is outside the powerful hand and reach of God to be saved. And now he's moving into when the church comes together, how should our worship be ordered? What are our roles and responsibilities? And the God-ordained establishment of the church is grounded in the God-ordained establishment of the family. This is unbelievably important. Paul forms his entire argument for the roles of men and women in the church in the beginnings, in the beginning of creation. We have human families. We are the children, the family of God. Paul does not root his argument in the context of any culture, of any time. And this argument, when we look at it, it's not Paul's argument. It's God's directive. Now think about it. The cosmic temple of Eden. Why was this cosmic temple established? For what purpose? For the glory of God and for his creatures to worship him. And it started with whom? Well, God created it. And then who was formed first? Adam. Then Eve as Adam's helper. Then the command came to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Not just children, but disciples, discipling. So you have man, you have woman, you've got the covenant of marriage, the creation and raising up of godly offspring. You know, rightly ordered corporate worship accords with rightly ordered family worship. The church is the family of God. Men are to be loving leaders. Women are assisting and helping. And their combined efforts are focused on making disciples of Christ in accordance with and submission to the triune God and his scriptures. A Puritan, an unknown Puritan, at least he was unknown to me, said this, The Christian family is a little church, a little government, and a little society. It shapes the foundation of the church and of society itself. Future generations depend on the leadership found in the home and the values they receive there. So there's really two primary focal points for this block of Scripture. If we take nothing else away, there's two things that as we move through this, we must realize Men and women have different yet equally significant roles when it comes to worshiping God and laboring on his behalf. And the second is this male and female roles and responsibilities regarding family or corporate worship are rooted and grounded in the creation and the fall. Just quickly, a, a few thoughts on the first one. So men and women have different yet equally significant roles when it comes to worshiping God and laboring on his behalf. Whether you're male or female, proper, rightly ordered worship flows from a heart of love. What is love? Biblical love? Sacrificial giving. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. So proper, rightly ordered worship flows from a heart of love and humility. Look, none of us can make a claim that we have the right to worship God. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All who are here and have been saved have been saved by the grace of God alone. Each of us 
who have repented and believed on Christ has a duty, a binding obligation, a covenant relationship when it comes to worship. The duty is not negotiable, nor is it open to debate or different interpretations. It's not a buffet. Oh, I like that. I like that. Yeah, give me a double portion of that. No way am I having any part of that. It is established by a holy, righteous, and perfect God. And our respective duties and roles as males and females are not superior or inferior to one another, but complementary. Males were created as males purposefully. Females were created as females purposefully. God was not surprised when you jumped out of your mother's womb. Oh, I had no idea. Oh, is that what she is or that? I, I didn't know. Our respective duties and roles are awesome. Every single letter of that word capitalized should put us in awe, should cause us to awe and to revere God, and should be undertaken with fear. For who is sufficient for such things? We have no claim in and of ourselves to be allowed to worship God, to approach the throne of God, or to serve Him. There is a link here between holiness and love and gratitude and obedience that we, we must see that link and rejoice in those truths. That second point, male and female roles and responsibilities regarding family or corporate worship are rooted and grounded in creation and the fall. Look, Paul's authoritative commands come from the word, both the incarnate word, that is Jesus Christ, and the inspired word. Look at verse 7 right here in chapter 2. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Paul is a preacher. That's, he's a, that means he's a herald. A herald has divine, a divine message. He's an apostle. An apostle is assigned. Nobody, there was no vote on who the apostles were going to be. An apostle has an authoritative message. It's not his, but God's. And a teacher, a teacher gives us information that is challenging and new. What's Paul teaching here? It's not math or English or science, but how to rightly relate to God and to one another. These commands are infallible, means that this is the word of God. It is, all scripture is God breathed. These words, these commands work across generations, across cultures, across all time. For all who are part of the church. Every age from the time Christ was resurrected until the day he comes back to rapture the church to himself. And with those thoughts in mind, let us turn to our passage, which is the governing word of God. Verse 8, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or 
quarreling. Very interesting. So place. <clears throat> I desire then that in every place. So the Greek word has the context of gathering for worship. That's what he's talking about. In every place that you gather for worship. Because the church today across the world has gathered in a multitude of locations. Homes, forests, parks, buildings. So place has the context of gathering for worship. I desire that in every place the men should pray. Not only should men pray, men should lead in prayer. Both at the home and in the church. Now look, look at the context. Paul's already given the instruction that prayers should be made, right? Verse 1 of chapter 2. First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. But in what order? God is a God of order. In the context of gathered worship, should people just randomly pray? No, the men are called to lead. What is meant by lifting holy hands? It's not an instruction as to how we are to pray, although there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with praying on your knees or standing, lifting holy hands. Hands, in this case, are representative of the heart and the spirit of a man. So as he prays, is he praying in humility? Is he praying in dependence? Is he praying in reverence? And lifting up connotates exalting or looking up to. You know, same words used in a, a couple of familiar passages in Matthew chapter 17. Uh, you remember this, the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. And so you've got Peter, James, and John are, are present. And Moses and Elijah show up, and oh boy, I mean, Peter's so confused that he just starts saying ridiculous stuff. And um, verse 5, he was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. Here it is. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. When they lifted up, when they looked up, who's there? Not Moses and Elijah, Christ alone. And Jesus himself, in what is known as the high priestly prayer, in John chapter 17, this is just before he goes to the cross. Verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Jesus, in his flesh, fully human, what does he do? He lifts up his eyes, totally and completely dependent, humble, reverential, To God the Father. And Jesus Christ as our divine mediator is over and above us. He is the source of all that pertains to life and holiness. We look to him for all things. We should, when we come to the throne of grace and pray, we must do so realizing our complete and total dependence on Christ. Now the word hand here is very interesting. So holy hands, if you even imagine this, doing this. 
It's by the help or the agency of. So it's applied to God, symbolizing his might in upholding and preserving. It implies dependence on God, specifically Jesus Christ, our mediator. Look at, if you'd like, uh, Matthew chapter 8. A couple verses I'm just going to move through to give you. You'll see, same word used here, Matthew chapter 8, verse 3. This leper comes to Jesus and he says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand, same word, and touched him saying, I will be clean. Verse 15 of chapter 8. He touched her hand and the fever left her and she rose and began to serve him. Jesus healed Peter's mother with his hand, with his outreach. Chapter 9, verse 18 of Matthew. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. Verse 25 of chapter 9. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand. And the girl arose. And then finally, Matthew 14, verse 31. You remember this. Jesus walks on water. Peter says, if it's really you, Lord, call me out of the boat. And he says to Peter, come. And what happens? Peter's walking on water. He's looking right at Christ. He can't believe it. The other 11 in the boat can't believe it. He, he, and what's he do? He turns to the left, turns to the right. As soon as he does that, whoosh. verse 31 of chapter 14, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to, you, to him, Oh, you of little faith, why? Did you doubt? Uh, Jesus Christ, you know, we're reaching out and up. Jesus Christ is reaching out and da down. He is present. He is saving. He is aiding us against the enemy. Are we lifting up holy hands to acknowledge this truth, to acknowledge the glory, the power the person of Jesus Christ. You know, men must not offer prayers from a position of unholiness. Now, unholy prayer is found in men who are harboring bitterness, ingratitude, unforgiveness, or e any other ungodly emotion toward God or toward another person. Where do we see this in Scripture? Well, first off, John chapter 13. I'm going to give you the... proper understanding here. John chapter 13, starting in verse 34. Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Not secretly harboring anger or bitterness. Not coming to God like the Pharisee, proud, exalting himself. But love for one another, because there is no way that you can say that you love God while you're harboring bitterness or anger or resentment against another human being who's created in the image of God, and certainly not against a brother or sister in Christ. But to drive this point home even more impactfully, Matthew chapter 5. Starting in verse 21, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. 
But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. So, what's being offered at the altar? Not sacrifices. Prayers, your heart. You know, uh, so our oldest daughter, Haley, uh, she was 10 at the time. And so uh, we're in the kitchen. Uh, Heather's making uh, dinner. I'm, I'm probably doing nothing, but I'll tell you, I was setting the table or trying to assist in some way. And um, one of the kids is talking to us about, oh, can we go do th this and that with so-and-so? And it was... it. It was not a wise thing. And I, we were like, no, you can't. Well, why not? Johnny's parents and Jimmy's parents and Sally's parents, they're letting them do it. And I, whichever one of my children it was, I just looked at him and said, well, you know what? All their parents are fools and idiots. Okay? So, no, you're not doing it. Because that's a ridiculous idea. So Haley, she steps out of the kitchen. She's gone like two minutes, comes back. We're sitting at the table. A lot of wisdom here. She waits. There's some kind of calm at the table. And she says to me, uh, Dad, you know what you just did? I said, no. She goes, you sinned. I go, oh, really? I'm like, okay, tell me more. You called the parents fools and idiots. You murdered them in your heart. And I'm, now I'm just a, we're all just new Christians. I mean, I'm, I'm like a Christian for like a year and a half. And I'm looking at her like, what? She goes, yeah, it's in the Bible. Matthew chapter five. I'm like, come on. I'm like, right. she goes, yep, pulls out her Bible, throws it up on the table. She, I'm like, whoa. You want to be humbled, have a 10 year old in front of your family call you out and, and then back it up with scripture. <laughs> so now I've got to, what am I going to do? Because I have, I have sinned. So I, I prayed, I repented before God, I acknowledged my sin, I repented in front of my family. Hey, this is wrong. We, we should not. That, that's that's unharboring those types of thoughts and ideas. Now, the idea was not a great idea that these parents had. But the way that I responded to it, just as much sin as whatever sin I saw in them doing this. So is your speech marked by condemning others or praying for others? Are you more quick to condemn or are you more quick to pray? I'd love to tell you that I've perfected this now. I don't do that anymore. Uh, I've gotten a lot better at it, praise the Lord. But I think all of us, we need to be tremendously sensitive to this. We are very quick, very quick to condemn and very slow to pray. Men in particular. First Peter chapter three. And you can flip there. I'm going to read it to you. Uh, I'm going to give you just a, I'm going to add a couple of just thoughts in the verses here. OK, so here's what Peter says. He says, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. How do we do that, man? How do we live with our wives in an understanding way? We're not to neglect our wives. We're not to domineer, be domineering over them. We're to showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. She's been designed to grow in godliness through your loving leadership. Still a vessel of mercy, a vessel of grace. But she's been designed to grow in godliness through your loving leadership. Since 
they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Okay, I'm bringing this back to worship, family worship, corporate worship. Listen, a church of men who refuse to pray is a treacherous and rebellious group. Representative of those who are foolish, uncaring, and unloving. So, I'm going to ask you this, men. When was the last time that you've come to a corporate time of prayer? If you were to face Jesus out in the lobby and he asked you, what excuse would you give that you think would be acceptable? The spiritual health of this family, men, depends on us. It depends on our willingness to go to battle in the prayer room. And wives and women, even if you're not married, you need to encourage. If you're married, you need to encourage and help your husband by saying, hey, let's go together. There's nothing more important than this. And women, if you're not married, you need to support our times of prayer by being present. And praying when you're called on to pray. He says here, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. You know, anger, it, uh, it's, it means wrath. In this context, it means wrath. So, not like, we're not to, we're not to be like the sons of thunder. Right? John, James, right? John, the apostle of love. Luke chapter 9. Jesus is setting his face. He's going to Jerusalem. They're going to go to a Samaritan town first. They call on the Samaritans to make preparations, make way. Here comes the Lord. And the Samaritans are like, eh, who's this Jesus? So, so what did James and John do? John, the apostle of love. Jesus should we cast hellfire down on them and just kill them all? That's wrath. We're not to pray in wrath. We're not to pray. We're not to, no anger. No, that, that's not to even, no way that should be present. But rather, we're to leave it to the wrath of God, right? Romans chapter 12. You know, great chapter, the mark of a true Christian. Romans chapter 12, verses 18 and 19. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So no anger. And remember, all sin is sin first and foremost against God. So any sin against you, any sin against the church, any sin against humanity is sin against God first and foremost. He will repay if there is no repentance. We don't have to worry about that. He will make all things right. A quarreling, okay, is the idea of this inward reasoning or deliberating or questioning what is true. We're not to come in prayer in anger or quarreling, this, this unsteadiness, this, oh, I'm not real sure. Well, that doesn't sound right. Uh, Luke 
chapter 5. Jesus is the, the paralytic, you'll, you remember this account, the, the paralytic being uh, lifted down through the roof. In verse 20, Jesus says, uh, I, when he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies, who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, why do you question in your heart? Why do you question? Same word. Verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 8. The man with the withered hand. But he knew their thoughts and said to the man with the withered hand, come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. He knew their thoughts. Their thoughts about what? Their thoughts about their quarreling within themselves about who is this? What, is this possible? Is this true? And then one of my favorite chapters in Scripture, Luke 24, verse 38. So Jesus has appeared on the road to uh, Emmaus. Luke 24, verse 38, and he said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? A church of men who are given over to questioning and doubting regarding the promises of God and the person of Christ will not be a church of prevailing prayer. And where uh, Ray is leading us through the epistle of James, and we touched on this block of scripture here this morning, and it's really worth reiterating here. James chapter 1, starting in verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, how do I, how do I act? How do I respond? What, what am I to do? Let him ask God prayer, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So men, are you convicted? We should be. Do you see the blessings that we are forfeiting through our lack of praying with holy hands? Through the ignoring of these instructions. Verse 9 of First Timothy chapter 2. Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire. It's so interesting. So likewise also. Then he goes on to speak about how women are dressed. What? What, what is going on here? So likewise also women should pray. But in submission and alongside, not out in front of their husbands or under the properly constituted male headship of the local church. Some women are phenomenal prayers because they have a deep relationship with Christ and are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. But a woman's role and responsibility in the context of corporate worship is made clear. Doesn't matter how gifted one may be. This is what God calls the church to. Women must also make sure they're praying with holy hands. And that's what Paul's getting to here. In regards to dress, physical appearance, is, is Paul against women dressing nicely? No. Outward dress reflects the inward heart. 
Is a woman's dress seeking to draw attention to her physical characteristics, or is it accentuating and illuminating something and someone greater than herself? Look, this is not just an issue with females. There are plenty of men who dress hypocritically. I present to you the Pharisees. Matthew chapter 23. The woes that Jesus pronounces on the Pharisees. Matthew 23 verse 27. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. An outward beauty should not be overstated and it should not detract or distract from a woman's inward beauty. Nothing is more beautiful and nothing makes you more beautiful than clothing yourself in Christ. Now, the word adorn here in this verse is an English translation of the Greek word cosmeo. Sound familiar? It's where we get the word cosmetics. It means to adorn or put in order. There's no sin against dressing nicely or being fashionable. The sin is in the heart. What is your motivation for dressing as you do? Are you accenting him or are you highlighting yourself? It's this desire to get out in front. Modesty and self-control are two attributes that set a godly woman apart from a worldly woman and tr two attributes that reflect the beauty of Christ. Christ was both modest and self-controlled. He is the, the explanation of those two words. Think about how the world markets beauty to women. Beauty is not about modesty or self-control, but about strutting your stuff and putting your business out there. That's, that's what the world says is beautiful. And there were people of God who, who did that, and it did not go well with them. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 30. So Jeremiah here, he's a prophet, and he's prophesying that God's people are going to be carried off into exile. And you, O oh desolate one, what do you mean that you dress in scarlet, that you adorn yourself with ornaments of gold, that you enlarge your eyes with paint? In vain you beautify yourself. Your lovers despise you. They seek your life. The world, the ruler of this world, 